Hi everyone and welcome to our With Women series. This is episode three and we've got Lindsay with us today. Thanks Lindsay for joining us. Um, so we will start by introducing ourselves briefly and then we'll talk more about uh, all of your experiences and wisdom. Um, so I'm Amy, um, I'm a doula with Greater Manchester Doulas. Um, salt and vinegar is my favorite flavor of crisp. <laughs> and um, fun fact is I own a van and I'm converting it into a camper. Ellie, go. Cool. <laughs> I'm Ellie and I work with Amy and Laurie at Greater Manchester Doulas. And Laurie is with us today, but not in the thing. She's looking in the comments because she's not feeling very well. Hey, <laughs> there she is. Um, and my favourite flavour crisp this week has been salt and vinegar twirls. And oh, I've been yes. eating them while I've been making my dinner and then my dinner's been ready and I've been full of crisps. And I've done that more than once this week. And <laughs> so, fun fact about me is I'm moving and anybody who knows me is probably very bored of me talking about my moving process. No. Yeah, you have to say that. We're excited. <laughs> Thanks. Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Um, I'm a mum, obviously. And uh, my daughter's coming up to two now. And I've pretty much been obsessed with anything to do with pregnancy, birth, babies, which I think started when I got pregnant, but was pretty much cemented when I did a hypnobirthing course. And it just blew my mind that birth and pregnancy is is nothing like um, what you expect it to be, I don't think, before it actually happens to you. And um, I was sort of forever changed after that point. And I just love chatting about birth and babies and breastfeeding and that's why I'm here to um to chat today really so you're a breastfeeding peer supporter aren't you if you want I am yeah you. um well what, what I want to say it a is... sort of peer supporter because I trained about a year ago now and I was just about to finish my training and get my qualification when the pandemic hit so I did all my training and then I had nothing to know where to kind of for that knowledge to go um, so it's been quite frustrating, really, waiting to hear when that's going to be able to start up again. Um, so I'm, I quite like being in breastfeeding groups online as well. I pretty much lived in Facebook breastfeeding groups when I had my daughter. So um, I'm still in all those. So I'm still always talking about it in there and trying to help other people when I can. Um, but I'm really desperately waiting for when I can start actually helping people in the flesh because breastfeeding is something that you, it's really difficult to do if you're not face to face um to get that help and support so um yeah I'm just waiting for that to start up again really that's cool where are you hoping to do it where yeah sorry you're a bit quiet um in Stockport, right. Stockport. so I live in Stockport um and we're really lucky we have a really really good um infant feeding team here um that really saved my skin um when I had my daughter it wasn't a particularly easy journey um and if I hadn't have had that regular support I'm lucky that there's a group literally kind of at the end of my road and there's a different group on every day in Stockport at different times all around the areas that are covered with um lactation consultants and peer supporters um so we have a really really good level of support and that was another reason why I wanted to be a peer supporter because I really felt like I wanted to be able to give something back um and kind of repay um all the skills that people had shared with me um to help other people so that's how I ended up doing that um awesome it's powerful stuff isn't it when you get that support the the desire to pass it on is so strong and it it just makes it, it helps to create that village that we're all told that we should have and don't have. Yeah, and that's part of it as well, because I think we, li we just, to me, we seem to live such isolated lives now compared to, obviously I've not lived before now, but what you, what you feel like you need as a mother. I, I feel like that anyway, even though I've got caring friends and family, it's really difficult to actually get the level of support that you actually need and breastfeeding is linked in with that that's why I'm so passionate about postnatal care and planning for life after birth because when I was having my baby I planned so much for the birth I did hypnobirthing I put all this 
massive amount of energy into thinking about what I wanted and how I wanted my birth to be. And I almost had like this brick wall from that point where the baby came out that I hadn't, I think part of me was a bit scared and I couldn't quite envisage what it would be like to have a newborn baby to care for, but I just hadn't planned past that point. And I didn't really have many expectations either. One of my friends had said to me, oh, yeah, it's not as hard as you think. They sleep all the time. You know, I have my husband's dinner on the table when he gets home from work. And I, that was kind of what was in my head when I had my baby. And it's not like that. And breastfeeding is not like that either. I went into it thinking, you know, I'll give it a go. I'll see what happens. But, you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But once I actually had that baby, the hormones take over and I, I was going to move heaven and earth to feed her myself. There was nothing that was going to stop me from, from being able to do that. I was so determined and it wasn't something that I was expecting or had planned for. It was something sort of primal, I think, that just took over and I had that need and I was going to do whatever I could, even when it was painful, when it was hard, when it was exhausting. Um, just there was something inside me that just drove me to to achieve what I wanted to do. Um, or maybe it wasn't inside me. Maybe it was inside her. It was probably led by her more than me. <laughs> um, I think, though, that that desire to... The determination to breastfeed is what it really comes down to because the statutory support well the immediate statutory support in terms of midwives their training is so so limited um and women told that they can't breastfeed and or that they need to top up with formula it's so routine to be told that and yeah. it's shocking the amount of women who who want to and are told that they can't and it really just does come down to support the more you learn about it so unfortunately it does come down to women who are really determined and, and determined to find that support for themselves because it's not automatically going to be handed to you if there's a problem formula is going to be the first thing that women are, are offered and especially if they're in hospital um, yeah. and yeah it's just such a shame so it unfortunately it does come down to individuals finding out where the support can come from what support is available and I think there's a, a misconception that breastfeeding peer supporters aren't very well trained, but they have more training than midwives. Um, yeah, actually, and GPs. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely GPs. Jeez. <laughs> um, and yeah, so if any if anyone watching or watching afterwards wants to get in touch with a peer supporter, are there any like tried and tested routes to finding one? The easiest way nationally, so wherever you live, is the Breastfeeding National Helpline. Um, that's a, a phone line that's manned by peer supporters and lactation consultants. Um, so you can get telephone support. I'm pretty sure it's 24 hours a day, but don't quote me on that. I might be wrong. Um, and then it's different on your area and it's a bit of a postcode lottery, um, depending what kind of funding your area has. Um, but you should be given all the information by your midwives in your hospital on um, your local breastfeeding support. But that's why it is such a shame because I know I'm so lucky where I live that we have really good peer support groups that are set up and run by the local um, NHS trust um, and work really closely with the infant feeding team. They don't have much funding for it at all. The funding is shocking and all the peer support is volunteers. And I think they have four members of staff um, that are paid to cover the whole of Stockport. Whereas I think Manchester from St Mary's, they actually have some paid peer supporters and they have a much bigger budget. So if you live in Manchester, then um, there might even be a better level of support. I don't know, to be honest. I just know that they have some paid staff. Um, and obviously, I find Facebook groups a really good source of support as well. There's a lot of really good um, Facebook groups because so many peer supporters are really passionate and want to help in their time as much as they can. Um, and I got a lot of support from them. But outside of that, it's private lactation consultants and private support. And, you know, not everyone, not many people can afford that level of support. And it's a shame how many people you see seeking professional help from lactation consultants. And it's, it's you know, it's great 
that you can have a career as a lactation consultant, but it makes me really sad and angry that women have to seek that support privately. And if it was started on day one in hospital from that very first feed, and even before that in antenatal classes, the, the NHS classes, the, the way that they just quickly touch on breastfeeding, it's not enough to prepare you. It certainly wasn't for me. I didn't do NCT or anything like that, so I can't comment. Um, I think I find the opposite, Sada, that we are relying on volunteers and we're relying on well, women's free labour and the fact that they it's their passion, but it's still work and that is yeah, it's not it's not remunerated and that's not no. that's not okay. <laughs> so and it's it goes back to the whole to the entire kind of sphere of of mothering that it's not seen as valuable mm. by society and the patriarchy. Because if they did see the value in that and the start that it gives children, all children who grow up and become, you know, adults of the future, then the world would be a very different place. But yeah, it's so unfortunately short where the funding goes, like I think I saw, I'm not going to quote me on the maths here, but for every pound that they put into um, breastfeeding support, the amount of pounds it would save the NHS is astronomical. It really, it really is. Um, and it's, yeah, because yeah. the statistics show that breastfed babies have fewer GP appointments, have fewer illnesses. And my personal experience, and this might just be a pinch of salt, but um, my daughter's nearly two now. She's never had a temperature once. And she's had a couple of sniffles, never even had a really terrible cold. She's never had an infection. Um, she had a stomach bug once and that is literally like the only illness that she's ever had. Um, so I could just be very lucky, but my experience of it has been that it has led to me having sort of a happier, healthier child, um, in my opinion, anyway. If you, well, it's not really an opinion if, if your child's got to two and only and only had one stomach bug. And yeah. That's not luck, because there's a whole community <laughs> of breastfeeding mums who have the same luck. And they can't all be kids. <laughs> no. Suspicious. Yeah, yeah suspicious. <laughs> one of luck. Um, Laurie's, Laurie's made a comment. She wants to ask you a question, if that's all right. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, how my breastfeeding journey started and how their support helped. And I was going to say, actually, this is what I was going to go back to. So to start from the beginning, I had my daughter at home. Um, she was a planned home birth, but she happened very quickly midwife came um, and didn't think I was an established labour and left again. And I think this was actually just that hypnobirthing was working so well. And I looked so zen that she didn't think I was that far along. So she said, oh, I think you should both go to bed and get some rest and I'll go and just call me if you need me. She called and I disappeared onto like planet, I don't know, planet labour. It wasn't Earth, wherever I was. And um, in my head, it felt like probably about 30 minutes, maybe, before I started thinking, oh, God, like something's happening here. It turned out I'd been an hour and a half. But I went to the toilet thinking I just needed the toilet. I'm not in, I'm not in active labour, so it's all fine. And the next minute I knew she was coming. So I woke my husband up. He was asleep. He literally missed the whole thing almost. Woke him up and she was literally being born. <laughs> and she was born on the bathroom floor so when the midwife came they she was I think she was she was panicking there was a lot of flapping and she, she I think they were just very shocked as I was but I was actually still very calm because I was just happy that I'd done it myself it'd been completely undisturbed and it was actually really calm and lovely till the midwife showed up and then it felt like a it's like something awful had happened but I was just over the moon with how it had gone and I was really lucky that my first feed was in my own bed at home and I, she had a really long feed for about 40 minutes before they started trying to look at me and stuff but my first feed she literally just came over to me and grabbed my boob and maneuvered the baby onto the nipple and just kind of you know, put a face in and was like, oh, there you go, that's beautiful. And at the time, I didn't think anything of it. I have to be honest. I just thought, oh, she's helped me to do my first feed. 
that's nice and I had a lovely feed then I ended up getting transferred to hospital because I had a tear and I needed stitches and I ended up having to have a spinal and stuff so and, a, and I had blood transfusion as well so I had a bit of a long recovery when I came around in recovery she was still fast asleep she was absolutely fine but then when it came to do my next feed I was like oh I don't really know what to do now how do I get how do I know she's latching properly how do I get it and I was like you know doing this little dance jiggle trying to get her to latch on you know I don't know what to do here and the support I got from the midwives from that point on was just really poor um when I was in recovery, it wasn't too bad, but then I got put into a side room, barely even saw anyone for hours. I'd had my stitches done at about nine in the morning. I barely saw anyone all day um, until about tea time. And I was like, what, what's happening? Am I staying in this room tonight? I don't know, you're moving to the ward. And then it went on and on. And I got moved on to a ward about 11 o'clock at night, by which point I was really emotional and fed up and so that first night I was in quite a bad place and when we'd been in the side room it was really warm and the baby had just been in a nappy and then we went into this ward and um, I buzzed a bell to get some help with feeding her because I didn't it was really painful I didn't feel like it was right and this as she was I don't know what she was I think she was some kind of assistant I assume that these kind of assistants were sort of like were trained when they were coming to help me um, and I found out later they weren't. I, I'm not sure what they are, to be honest. I think they're like the equivalent of like healthcare assistants or maternity assistants. Um, but the first thing she said to me was, well, you need to dress her. I can't do anything. You can't do anything with her like that. She's not got any clothes on. You've got to dress her. Call me when you've dressed her and disappeared. And at this point, I still had a catheter in. I was in a lot of pain. I couldn't really do anything. I hadn't dressed the baby myself because it had been done whilst I was having my stitches. I didn't even know how to dress a baby. I was like Googling how to dress her. And that was kind of then, that then stopped me, I think, from feeling comfortable with them and kind of put this barrier up of not feeling able to ask for help and support. So that kind of made that relationship with them quite difficult from then on. Sorry, I feel like I'm rambling a bit off the breastfeeding now. Um, so, yeah, then it was a difficult first night. She didn't want to sleep or be put down, which obviously now I know is completely normal, but at the time it was completely different from my expectations. The next day it was still painful. And I'd spoken to my sister, and my sister had breastfed, which is kind of how, probably how I wanted to do it myself. And she said to me, it's Wednesday. The breastfeeding group is on downstairs today. Speak to the midwife and see if they'll send a peer supporter up. Should I know they do that? See if they will. And I must have asked all day, every time I saw someone, can you send somebody to help me breastfeed? I'm in pain. I don't think it's right. And a midwife would just have a little look and go, well, the latch looks fine, but I'll see what I can do. And just nobody came back to me. I ended up speaking to one of these healthcare assistants about it, who I thought was trained. And she told me, um, don't feed too long, feed 10 minutes on one side, then change 10 minutes to the other side and keep changing every 10 minutes, which is completely wrong. And I went home from hospital, just still not having a clue what I was doing. And I was desperate to get home. I was desperate to get home. So I was really emotional and I think they got a little bit worried about at that stage because I kept crying but I just wanted to go home I wanted to get away from that ward and I knew that there was the peer support group on there at my house so when she was three days old I went down there and she was tiny they were all really shocked to see me they said what are you doing here and I said I need help I need help and I know that the earlier I get it the better chances I've got so and I would that's probably the best advice I'd give to anyone is if you are struggling when you're breastfeeding, it's just get help as early as you can, even if you have to drag yourself out to a peer support group or you have to ask someone you know to come round when they're allowed. Just get that help as early as you can. Because even though I got that help um, at three days and they, and they really did help me a lot, they took pictures um, of me positioned really well and gave me so much help and support on how to latch I still ended up with quite a bad wound which I think had probably started when I was in hospital a few days later I was still in a lot of pain and 
I thought, what is this? And I thought, is it thrush? What is it? And I looked down and on the underside of my nipple, there was a hole. That was, this is the only way to describe it, like a wound that got infected. And then I had to express off that side for a few days. So then I had to keep going back and kind of getting prescriptions and help. But without them, I wouldn't probably have got the treatment I needed for that because I, I just genuinely don't believe that a GP would have supported me to keep breastfeeding through that and give it, they helped me with a pumping schedule. They helped me with keeping it clean. Um, and I just know that I just, without them, I wouldn't have been able to have got through that at all. So that's probably the moment when they really, really saved it and turned it round for me. Um, because you just go, you just don't get that kind of support from other healthcare professionals. And it, like we were saying, it is just really sad that so much of that is down to volunteers to keep that service going. Because in the long term, it's so much better for mums and babies and society if breastfeeding can succeed. Um, but it, it sadly it doesn't seem like things are going to change. But thankfully, we have all these amazing women that want to come together and help each other. Um, so, yeah, I think that was kind of the start of my journey and probably what I meant by saving my skin. I'm sorry that that first feed was so interrupted and so hands-on um you said that you were lucky to have that in bed but that wasn't luck you chose to be at home <laughs> um no one gave you that <laughs> um but what what they did do was interrupt that that natural instinct that you would have had if no one got involved yeah. um, and that must have had a huge impact on your confidence in yourself because if if no one had said do it this way or physically put your baby on your breast you would have done it and you'd have done it fine yeah. but it's that need to to interrupt straight away um it completely undermines um your your confidence and your intuition and I think that's a massive part of why breastfeeding starts off so difficult for a lot of women um because that confidence is taken away um and it's about getting that back but it's it's so hard to get it back after yeah. it's been taken away so I'm glad that you found people that helped you to find that confidence again but I'm sorry that it was taken away from you in the first place yeah it's frightening as well though that in I mean I suppose you, your head is all over the place when you've just given birth but at the time I didn't think anything of it I look back and I think you know it was it was a violation really and but that's just the norm and why is that the norm that they kind of step in and take over and do it for you because they're their probably driven thought is that get that baby on the breast and get that baby feeding and get that baby get that baby healthy and thriving but that's not beneficial to anybody's to anybody's health long term we need to be giving women the skills because it is a skill to breastfeed and it's not something that just happens and that's something that I think that a lot of women aren't aware of either before they start to breastfeed. You think it's the most natural thing in the world. But in generations previously, there has been that village of support of mums and aunties and grandmas and cousins that have breastfed and have passed that knowledge down through the generations. And over the past sort of hundred years, that that knowledge and those generational links have been just been eroded and eroded away to the point where we don't have that community fountain of knowledge anymore. So it's not natural anymore because you just don't have that natural help. We literally need to be taught to breastfeed and that should be started in antenatal classes and it should be started the moment you have your baby. You, you know, you should be taught to put the baby to your breast or let the baby do it themselves, you know, which I don't think... But partly because of the way my birth was that it was all a bit of a flap 
Um, and as well, I think I lost quite a lot of blood, which I wasn't aware of in the moment. I wasn't in any, any even in any pain. But I think in hindsight, the midwives were probably quite scared about the, the blood loss. Um, so the baby was taken away from me and dressed and then brought back to me as well before I fed her, which in hindsight, again, really makes me sad. Oh, because although I did, I, I got skin to skin immediately and before the midwives arrived on the bathroom floor. And that was a lovely special moment. Now I think, mm, but it didn't happen in the most special way that it could have done because um, she was taken away and dressed and then brought back to me. So that interrupted the natural bonding of the first feed as well. So that was also something that I wasn't aware of at the time. And afterwards, I only thought about it and thought, oh, next time I'm going to do it differently. But it is so wrong that these things just happen normally. And unless you intervene and you stop these things from happening, then that is probably what is going to happen as par for the course with midwives. Yeah. It is unfortunate that if you want the physiological, the most normal thing, you really do have to, you have to figure out how to make that happen ahead of time. And yeah, I mean, we could talk all day about that, but I am sorry that it was your experience. And I hope you know that it is okay to be happy that you got immediate skin to skin and sad and outraged that the first feed and the, the, the skin to skin didn't, happen on your own terms for as long as you wanted it to because it should be your choice and I'm sorry that didn't happen Laurie says it's a real testament to your resilience and inner knowing that you didn't let midwives repeatedly telling you everything is fine stop you from seeking the right support oh yeah yeah I mean the, the, the midwife put the baby to your breast and said that's a beautiful feed but that is not for her to decide she didn't know if it was painful for you she didn't know if it was comfortable for you she probably didn't even check to see if she was sucking um she just decided yeah um, and, and a more cynical person uh, than me all right it's me um, <laughs> might think that when a midwife does do the hands-on uh, showing you how to breastfeed it's it's less about facilitating feeding and more about making the woman reliant on somebody else and undermining her own confidence just a cynical person who might who yeah. just said that to me. Um, but yeah, sorry, Laurie's comment. Um, yeah, that is that's fantastic that, that you did do that. And yeah, my, my experience was very similar as well. I had other people telling me that the latch was fine and therefore I was fine and the baby was fine, but I just knew something wasn't right. And I ha I kept doing what you did to, to dig a little deeper and to access the right support until I found. And um in my case, it was very, very. Uh, Laurie says there's no one more cynical than me. Maybe you <laughs> having a cynical war. But for me, my breastfeeding issue was solved. Um, I think I'd seen three different professionals, and you know the the boob baby head ratio is so so massive in the beginning. I I didn't know what was going on beneath, like here, of my daughter or or of my boob, and uh, I had a friend come around who was. NCT. I don't know what she was doing. She was she she had some qualification and wasn't paid for her time, um, and it was just that her lip, her bottom lip was like this, and my friend just went, "How's that?" And I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> that's it. It doesn't hurt anymore. That's what it was. Do you call it flange?" She oh. And that and that was it. But I I um, but. If I hadn't, I, I might I might have given up had somebody just kept telling me, oh, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine, because it wasn't fine for me. And to hear that it's fine, but it's technically fine, but it still hurts, does that mean that the, the breastfeeding relationship is sustainable then? So I'm glad that I, like yourself, um, did do that. And I'm glad that you're now in a position to be um, like that person was for me who helped me. Oh, I'm so glad that you got the right support as well. And... Do you know what? That's what a lot of breastfeeding success comes down to is the people that are around you. Because, you know, I've got other friends who who might not who haven't had family members and friends that have breastfed and they've had people around them that just say, Oh, just give them a bottle. 
you know, they can see, they can see they're tired, they can see they're in pain, they can see it's not working, and they go, just give them a bottle. And they've got to that point where they're that tired and they've just gone, oh, yeah, I'll just give them a bottle. It's, it's fine, you know, fed his best, I'll feed the babies. It's fine. And it is fine if that's what you want to do. And that's the thing about breastfeeding as well is that I think a lot of people seem to get really angry and offended about people that are passionate about breastfeeding as if you're against people who formula feed or choose to feed your baby in a different way. And that's just not the case. But as we're discussing, there are so many barriers in the way for women who want to breastfeed and that's the important thing for me. I want any woman who wants to breastfeed to be able to breastfeed. If you want to use formula and if you want to bottle feed, that's your choice and you're allowed to make that choice and nobody should judge you for it. That's your decision. It's your baby. You have autonomy. But there aren't barriers to formula feeding. There are so many barriers to breastfeeding that we just have to keep breaking down. And they only happen with this amazing, supportive community of people around you, whether that's peer supporter groups, whether that's professionals, whether that's your husband or your partner that is quite happy to go and do everything else around the house and take care of everything in your life. So you can just sit and feed that baby 24-7 or family to drop stuff off or friends are going to come round and kind of keep you going and offer you that support. Like you absolutely do need a village to breastfeed. It's not a one person choice or a one person thing. You can't get through it without having that level of support, which is why it's really important as well to me to have so many voices passionate about breastfeeding. I feel like I probably bore everyone I know about it because I'll post about it on social media and I'll talk about it. But I think, well, it's just me chatting on about breastfeeding can make one person that maybe that I don't really know on Facebook makes them know something about breastfeeding that they didn't know or make them consider it when they didn't before or that they know that, I'm, that I've got skills in breastfeeding and that they know someone that knows about that, then like that's what I'm all about because there's just not enough knowledge and skills and passion out there in the mainstream parenting world for, bre- for breastfeeding to be as successful as it should be um, and I'm just really passionate about making a change and trying to be a little a little piece and changing things for the better really and hopefully helping more and more people to succeed. It might that was a good speech that wasn't it? <laughs> it was a great speech um, and it might feel like you're kind of going on about it but it takes that to to counteract all of the negative stuff that you hear and it's the same with us and birth we we do the same thing we're talking about it all the time um to anyone (laughs) basically um and it it's because it takes all of that to and a lot more to counteract and to to kind of try and rebalance the information that's out there because it's so heavily one-sided and it's always against the the more natural way of doing things and it yeah I mean it doesn't matter how much you feel like you're rambling it if it reaches one person it's it's doing something and it's yeah yeah, doing something to counteract the (laughs) the amount of stuff that you hear to the kind of opposite effect because I, I don't know very many I, I don't because it's not the norm to breastfeed unfortunately it's the biological norm but is it the norm in society no it's definitely not it it really makes me wonder if choosing to formula feed I know it seems like a choice but is it a choice if your partner's against it your friends are against it your family's against it everything you see on tv it's always a bottle of formula is it an informed choice or does it feel like the only thing that you can do um, with, with the amount of support that's out there? Uh, and I don't mean the support in terms of what you and, and others offer. I mean, if the first person who hands you your, your baby <laughs> is talking about getting your baby on a bottle and not, not talking to you about the realities and the practicalities of breastfeeding and it's only talking about bottle feeding, like, is it an informed choice? 
and I guess it's I guess it's the same with what what we do with birth as well like more, more women say oh I choose to go to hospital I choose to get an epidural I choose to do this thing and it's like let's look at it really because really you've been socialized to to want this thing and it's it's so much bigger than getting to this point and then choosing a or b because you've been led so far down a path by the the choices that you've felt like you've made along the way that you've ended up with less choices see i'm the rambling one now <laughs> yeah but, so that's why we need voices that are so passionate to really stand out because the white noise is to 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 do what the mainstream does and that's what is fed to us drip fed to us constantly through every avenue possible so it's wonderful when you hear someone who is as passionate as you clearly are um, oh thank you julie who julie is not a, a cynical soul but she has okay, pointed out that if someone does grab your boob without asking that that is the <laughs> fault and yeah so it's it's much more it, it's much more sinister than helping you to feed if somebody touches yeah. your body without consent that is not help that is assault Laurie says, do you think there are things women can do in pregnancy to give themselves the best foundation for a successful breastfeeding journey? Oh, that's a really good question. And yes, definitely. Um, there's so much information out there. Um, a book that I've read since is the Positive Breastfeeding book, which is quite a good, just sort of easy reading start um, to learn about breastfeeding. So I'd recommend that book as a starting point, but there's obviously lots of other books out there. I'm not on the BBC, but um, other books are available. Um, and YouTube. This is something that would never have occurred to me when I was pregnant, or even I don't think when I'd first had my baby and I was struggling. But when I went to my first peer supporter group, they actually wrote down some YouTube links for me of videos showing positive attachment and positioning and that's an amazing tool, especially at the moment, if it's difficult to access support. Um, UNICEF um, have a really good website. Um, I think it's called Baby Friendly Initiative. And they have loads of really good videos about breastfeeding and attachment and baby's brains. And that's a really good resource. Um, and yes, start learning about that when you're pregnant look it up, speak to your, your friends that have had babies, speak to them about breastfeeding. Um, if you've got friends that are breastfeeding, ask them if you can watch. We don't mind. Um, we, you know, we're used to it. I'm quite happy to, to give a demo to somebody. Um, just try and soak up as much information as you can really about what to expect. And, and it all links in as well with normal newborn behaviour, which again, doesn't fit into society's expectations I think a lot of people are unaware that a newborn baby wants to feed every two hours and it wants to be carried about on your chest it doesn't want to be put down in a cold crib or Moses basket um, and it's not just going to sit there and have a six hour nap whilst you also have a lovely long nap that's that is not what's going to happen and it's really hard when that happens and you're feeding a baby that doesn't want to stop feeding um, and you can literally be sat there with a baby attached to you for an hour or longer and it's hard so you I think another thing is to kind of plan for that make sure that your partner is fully aware of what to expect and if your choice is to breastfeed then what life is going to look like for you because it's a big adjustment and they're going to need to pick up a lot of slack and basically be your butler and wait on your hand and foot um, and be happy to do that as well. Um, and it might mean that you need more support from family and friends as well to drop things off for you. And you might need a bit more emotional support as well. So I think talking to your partner, your family, your friends about it as well, about your choice and about what you're expecting to happen really helps to normalise breastfeeding and um, make sure you have a really strong support network set up for you um, to make sure that, you know, you have the best possible chance and have um, 
contact details as well as well of professionals make sure you know like who your infant feeding team are phone numbers that you can ring and if you do need support where you can go to um and that might helpfully hope you feel prepared um for when you do start to breastfeed i think lots of pregnant women think that they have to wait to have their babies first before they can start talking about breastfeeding but I've yet to meet a peer support or a lactation consultant who isn't absolutely eager to talk to a woman while she's pregnant to talk about those issues before they come up and to talk about those expectations before they are shattered and the woman feels like she's doing something wrong. Um, because as great as it is to start our education on um, normal newborn behaviour and um, breastfeeding in pregnancy, in times past... We would have already had an education on breastfeeding and normal newborn behaviour because we would have been around so many other breastfeeding mums, and we would have noted we would have got to got maybe not the, got the hang of newborn care, but we would have been around so many more um, mums and babies, and we our expectations were to be managed because we would know what it was like because we would be around them, we'd be around breastfeeding, we'd be around babies, and that just doesn't happen. Uh, any any more so our education is it's not even just a lack of education I think it's um the things that we've learned about breastfeeding and and newborns by the time we're pregnant um it's unlearning all of those things that we think that babies want and what feeding looks like and um so yeah the even I would say even before pregnancy um if you're planning a pregnancy be planning your postpartum be planning how you're going to meet your own needs um, when you have this newborn whose needs are so urgent and immediate and yeah to 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 plan for it all because it's really hard with your, with your first one i could imagine it either i could imagine the, the birth kind of but then just a black hole where <laughs> the yeah. newborn thing was i really wish i'd spent more time um planning for that and envisioning it i don't know if it's even possible to imagine your life changing so much but there are still practical things that you can do that you can you can um, imagine what your choices are in birth so you can write a birth plan and you can imagine what your options are for feeding and for yeah just how you want to handle that and how you're going to meet your needs because you're still going to be the same person and there's still going to be some things that you need you're still going to need to eat and sleep and rest and drink and do things that help you to feel like you so even if you can't imagine what it's going to be like to have a baby still think how are you going to meet your own needs so that you can meet the needs of your baby however you want to it's been a long day I hope you can <laughs> absolutely no, that. that makes That's a lot of sense I think um you you touched on it there as well but about the factoring it in to your birth plan your choices for birth where you want to birth who you want to be there because all of that has an impact and um, I know you said Lindsay that you're kind of you had a bit of a wall so you couldn't quite imagine that what was going to happen afterwards but do you did it kind of did feeding factor into your birth choices in any way or do you think it did like, I think probably like a lot of people, I thought I wanted to breastfeed. I mentioned, I think my sister had breastfed her um, her two children. So I had seen her feed and she was passionate about breastfeeding as well. So I was lucky, lucky that I had that influence in my life because not everybody does. But I didn't ask her enough questions. I didn't find out from her enough the reality of breastfeeding. Um, I kind of listened to all the positive things she had to say about it, but I don't think I got any sort of practical um, preparation from her. And so when I was kind of preparing for birth, I was like, you know, I want to breastfeed, but I'll just sort of see what happens. You know, I think I'd assumed that probably I would get some more kind of knowledge and care in hospital on it. I don't know. Or maybe I hadn't thought about it. Um, But because you hear other people as well that have, you know, that have struggled, I I think I was aware it wasn't going to be easy. 
and I was quite blase about it. I just thought, oh, I'll see what happens. Um, I'll see, if you know, if I can, I will. If I can't, then it's okay. Um, but I didn't, like I said, I think I said at the beginning, I didn't realise actually how important it would be to me to breastfeed. And I don't think I actually realised the quite the amazing benefits either until I started learning about it and immersing myself in it. And then I was like, actually, this is amazing. This isn't something that I'm blasé about anymore. This is something that is happening. Um, so, yeah, but okay. with hindsight, I wish I had prepared differently. Well, hindsight is, is <laughs> a wonderful thing, right? Um, I think it, it's it's wonderful that you you touched on emotional support there, um, because it's such it is it is so important. Um, well, for all of our lives, but having the right support around you, um, in your postpartum, and your your breastfeeding, and maybe you maybe you're struggling, maybe you've got issues, um it's so important to find that emotional support so that you can offload and complain and because the last thing you need is someone saying oh, why don't you just give formula like you haven't thought of it 40 times already that hour that is yeah. if you haven't thought what is going to make my life easier and, it, and instead of having those having the right people around you so that you can go oh and you can complain about that you didn't get maybe enough sleep or maybe the the latch is is brilliant on one side without somebody trying to fix it especially fix it with something that is the last thing that you want um even though there's, there's always that voice in the back of your mind isn't there or maybe i should do this maybe i should just do this having a place identifying those people that you can just offload to that you know that you're safe with you know that you can just complain and they'll just say i hear you i hear how hard it is for you right now what can i do is there anything i can do to make it any easier instead of trying to like kind of rush in so i'm glad that you identified that as a as a as a oh, yeah. postpartum yeah that is so true actually that is a massive point because so many people in your life will just want to say oh why don't you just give them a bottle there's not going to be many people i don't think in most people's lives that you can offload to about breastfeeding without somebody want to fix it with a bottle um which is why it is really important, I think, to have that peer support. Nobody else is going to understand like a mum who has breastfed. Or maybe somebody that's been very close to somebody breastfeeding. Like I'm really lucky my husband is really supportive. And, you know, I know that he would never tell anyone to give him a bottle. But unless you've been in that close relationship with breastfeeding, you've been in it, you've seen it. I think that it's very difficult for for people to give the right support unless you have been around breastfeeding which is why it is so important to increase breastfeeding and to support it in the community and to have that peer support because without it it's like almost like you're doomed to fail unless you get that and breastfeeding it is hard it takes an emotional toll as well as a, as well as a physical toll you have a baby attached to you almost constantly and if you're breastfeeding, it's likely that you want to parent responsively and follow the fourth trimester and you want to give that baby attachment as well. So you probably will have a baby attached to you 24-7. And it's hard. And I struggled massively with feelings of resentment towards my husband and feelings of loss of independence because you suddenly can't do anything when you want to do it you have a baby attached to you all the time. You have to manage eating your dinner with one hand and going for a wee and going to the loo, holding a baby. And you, you literally can't do anything anymore. And your life is completely upside down. And it is really hard to adjust to at first. Really hard. And you do get into the swing of it, but you need to be able to talk about that. And you need to be able to know that that's okay. It's okay if you feel feelings of resentment. I never thought that I'd feel resentful towards my husband every morning when he walked out to work without a care of his will to go and sit in his nice car with his comfy seat and his music playing and sit and have his lunch on his own. I never thought I'd feel resentful of that ever in a million years. And I felt really guilty for feeling like that. And breastfeeding is linked in with a lot of that because no one else can do it for you. 
you know you can't pass the baby over to grandma for a night with a bottle it's it doesn't work like that and you need to keep feeding to keep your supply going so it's not that easy just to take a break you can't take a break you've got to keep going so having that emotional support for somebody to sit with you and say it's okay to feel like that it's okay and it will get better and it will get easier um and I think that's just all my sister kept saying to me is it's so hard it is so hard but it will get better and just to trust in the process um and it does but you, you just do need like buckets and buckets of love and support to get there it is a I feel like breastfeeding is a team effort it's not just you on your own you've got to have um people around you there as well I'm waffling now I feel like I'm gonna stop <laughs> Not at all. You are not waffling in the slightest. Um, thank you for being so, just so honest about how difficult it is and giving that that advice on what support you need and those things that you need around you to meet your your needs so that you can meet your baby's needs. Because like you said, it's it's you. you can't, no one can do it for you, but they can hold you whilst you do it. Um, and yeah it's amazing an amazing journey that you've been on and where you are now is just fantastic yeah thank you I do I'm still feeding my daughter now she's nearly two um and I've been lucky probably in a, I just keep saying I'm lucky don't know I'm not lucky I'm not lucky this is my choice <laughs> yeah, my choice still like feeding it. a toddler um but I think because of lockdown I think that's probably actually helped because I did, I've not had the sort of pressures of outside society or pressure to go out and do things. Like I lost my job in the pandemic, which turned out to be a blessing, really, in a way. I had so much time with my daughter and we were able to carry on bonding um, and feeding and having a lovely time together. So that's probably helped. But, yeah, I'm still feeding now. And I just wanted to mention that as well, because that is definitely something we don't see in society enough and that, extended breastfeeding is this like huge taboo um mm. and it just shouldn't be you know mm. the WHO and the NHS still recommend breastfeeding until two and toddlers and older children still get so many best benefits from breastfeeding um and it's just something that is just if if breastfeeding in a newborn isn't supported enough <laughs> in society then I don't know what <laughs> breastfeeding a toddler is it's way 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 down the list um but there's plenty of people out there that are, that are doing it. So like most if you're someone that's, yeah, if you're someone yeah. that's feeding an older baby and feeling like societal pressures to stop, then uh, just completely ignore that and keep on boobing. Yeah. And again, reach out, find those other people, find your tribe because yeah. they're out there for sure. Um, and yeah, they are, mostly on Facebook. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook is definitely great for that. Comment from Laurie there. Oh, not waffle. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Well, thank you. Thank you for making me feel like um, I just always feel like I'm waffling and rambling, but thank you for making me feel like um, I've had a useful contribution. Absolutely. I've hung Definitely. on every word. And um, at the beginning, uh, before we went live, you were talking about all the things that you do and you couldn't decide what to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely talked about breastfeeding but we'd love to have you on again to talk about many of the other things that you couldn't decide uh, maybe maybe that's oh. the first thing that I asked you about was about breastfeeding so possibly that's why we ended up talking about this but I'm really, really <laughs> glad that we did oh thank you no I'd love to come on again I uh, probably could talk about many other things for quite a, <laughs> quite a lot of time so yeah anytime you're stuck for someone I'll come back over and waffle <laughs> you don't have to be stuck no. When Amy presses the button, please hang on. Sometimes people just just go. Like, oh no! Don't, don't go anywhere. <laughs> okay. All right. Unless unless you're in a rush, but yeah, yeah, you've got to go. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you so so much. Um, if there are if anyone wants to get in touch with you afterwards, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. The contact details if anyone wants to get in touch. Um, if you wouldn't mind sending us the links that you have to help women find breastfeeding support, um, the, the links that you mentioned as well, the UNICEF one, we'll put them underneath the video. Uh, any oh, yes. you want to share, we'll, we'll add them there. 
yeah okay yeah no I will do that's great Amy you want to do anything to sign off mm, I don't think so I think you did a good job anything about us just a massive thank you um us oh okay um you can get in touch with us through our facebook page or our website uh, or you can email us uh, our email address is hello at great so and that is all of the ways you can contact us you i think this is via instagram you can i'm on telegram now like a young person i still don't know what that is um <laughs> It sounds like an old person thing, not a young person yes, thing. Like when you when you get a hundred, you get a telegram from the queen. <laughs> All right, now it's yeah, we're, don't message us on Telegram. <laughs> yeah, no, don't. I won't know what to do with it. Don't send us a telegram either. Actually, no, that'd be cool. I've never got one. Letters um, can be sent to Ellie's new house. <laughs> yeah, they can. Right. Okay, we'll stop now because we are waffling. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> Bye, Facebook. Bye. Bye. <laughs>